before you all. Come and see me after the uh, sermon and tell me about how God never sleeps. Just listen to the passage. Kind of get where I'm going. Some of you already understand. I understand that God never sleeps, but we're going to find out that there was a time when he came to earth and did indeed sleep, and so I want to go from there. But first, I got to tell you, I was uh, I was struck by a couple of things that I I find funny. Now, when one is I don't have this on. Probably need to turn that on too. Is my phone down there? Did I leave it down there? I'm going to go see if I can find this real quick. You want me to get it for you? Huh? I don't want you to hurt yourself. Do you want me to get it for you? You had me up here doing. Well, I don't want you to hurt yourself now. Oh, okay. All right, so I, uh, I just got a few things on here I might want to reference. Um, and so I was thinking when Justin asked you, Brother Randy, where your wife was, that it would have been very funny if you'd have went, I, I don't know. <laughs> that just would be funny. I, I think it would be funny when people get put on the spot if you were like, uh, you know, if somebody said, uh, Brother Ken, would you pray for us? And he went, is that going to be okay? Sure, I can pray for you. I just would like to see people do weird things like that. Like one time I just want to go to a park with, uh, now some of these I made up, some of them I read, but I think this is real funny, with a mayonnaise jar and fill it full of um, like vanilla pudding and just sit with the mayonnaise jar, a Miracle Whip jar, and just eat from it and watch what people do when they go by. Wouldn't that be fun? Or how about if you just, uh, you know, in an elevator, wouldn't this be fun? Everybody that got on, you just introduce yourself. Shake their hand. Can't do it right now, of course, but uh, when we open back up. Hi, you know, Steve Hoover. I'd prefer you called me Admiral Hoover. Wouldn't that be fun? You don't think that's fun? I think it's fun. How about this one? These, these are some that I read that I found out that I thought were good. Um, <laughs> dress up as a devil and get in the elevator. When people get on, go, are you going down? There we go. See, the ones I the ones I made up, no good. Okay, I, I get it. Okay, I get it. There you go. Um, let's see, this, this is a good one. Stand silently and motionless in the corner facing the wall without getting off on the elevator. Would that be funny? Just You're just there in the corner. I mean, can you imagine what would be going through people's minds as you just went up and down in that elevator? Um, this is a good one. Just, I want you to imagine the effect this would have on you if you got onto an elevator and somebody was actually doing this. Just somebody standing there grinning at other passengers for a while and then announce, I have socks on. It just seems like a fun thing to do with me. And, and then the other one that I love, and I, and I actually may do this, this is on my bucket list. I love the idea of running into a mall and going to a crowd, of course. You can't just do it one person. It wouldn't be as cool. But you've got to run into a crowd like maybe in the food court and go, what year is it? And then when somebody tells you, go, it worked, and then run. You know, like the time travel thing. <clears throat> that would be fun. It didn't come off quite as good as I thought it would. But that's okay. Well, listen, we're going to go through a lot of Scripture today. I, I like to get up here and try to do something funny. And notice I said try. Um, and it, it, just to kind of loosen myself up. Uh, because, believe it or not, I get kind of nervous when I'm getting up here. And so I'm praying about it, and I'm like, okay, I can't just start preaching because I'm going to misread things, and I'm going to misstate things. And I do that all the time. I, I narrate books, uh, and, and so I make money narrating books, and I'm having fun with that. But if you could hear me, in my booth sometimes. I, there are just words that I, I have figured out now that I cannot say. I cannot say them properly. Words I've been saying forever. I'll give you one that I ran into a, a, a while back. Dissipate. I didn't used to say dissipate. For some reason, all my life, I said dissipate. My, my wife catches me. She's the one that gets me. I'll be talking and I'll say, you know, it dissipated. And she'll go, what did you just say? And then I and I know I've said something wrong. Another word, another one was um, it was a word for angry. Yes. How do you say it? Vehement. I said vehement. All my life I've been saying this word. And so as I'm reading, there are some words that I think I know, but I have to look them up. And and I've actually started collecting bloopers on my wife's advice. So I have this whole file of me reading, and I'll just give you an example of something that might happen in my narration booth. If I were reading the Bible, I would say, And the Lord has removed men far away. And the forsaken, forsaken, soak, let's soak. I need to soak. I need to go. And I'll just go on for like two minutes and record it. 
And then I go back and I listen to it. Or I'll say something and I'll go, I'll just be reading along and I'll be so frustrated because I've tried to do it five times that I'll read the word and I'll just sit there and go, and if somebody were sitting in my booth with me while I was narrating these things, they would just think I'm nuts. And I probably am. They'd be right. That's right. Okay, I'm loosened up now. Uh, storms. Wasn't that, I thought that was really cool that one of the things that they said in the song right there toward the end is I'm going to sing in the storm. And no matter where you come into what's going on now with COVID-19, no matter how you feel about it, no matter what you think ought to be done or what shouldn't be done or the reaction or any of that, you'll have to admit we're in a storm. This is something that um, is it's just causing problems. And we have those in our life. Now, let me start off by going back to this idea if you're in a storm, wake up, wake up Jesus. Um, now, I know that this title doesn't possess any depth of theological wisdom as far as Jesus being asleep. Um, but, I, like I said, stick with me as I go through this and understand the idea behind what I'm talking about. And, and we're going to start off, let's, let's have our opening text, and then I shall from there quickly depart, um, being the good Baptist that I am. Mark chapter 4, and this, this is actually told um, in a two different places. I picked Mark because I don't read out of Mark a lot for some reason, and I just found that, uh, you know, he probably needed some time. So, Mark chapter 4 and verse 35, and you're, if you're not quick at turning in the Bible, you may just want to have a pen and paper out to write down all the verses that I'm going to go through today. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41, and if you would, stand with me in honor for the Word of God. Um, it's something that we do here just to remind us, really, seriously, to remind us that there are different things that go on behind this pulpit. Sometimes I say things, sometimes I make jokes, sometimes I talk, but when we, we also read the Word of God, and that's different. That's completely different. That's absolute truth. And so we stand in respect to remind us that when we're reading Bible verses, this is God speaking. Mark chapter 4, and let me start reading in verse 35. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be? that even the wind and the sea obey Him. Pray with me. Father God, I thank You for Your Scripture. I thank You that no matter what else goes on in life, we can count on You. We love You and thank You in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So, Jesus did sleep, and they did have to wake Him up. And from the sounds of it, He slept very well. I and my pastor slash son have been on a boat in the middle of a sea and tried to sleep. It's an art, okay? In fact, when we left port, I will tell you, we thought we were on a ship. But when you get 16 hours out into the open ocean, everything becomes a boat, okay? It was all over the place. And I slept a little bit, but only because I had lots and lots of that motion sickness medicine in it, and I just couldn't keep my eyes open anymore. But I ended up on the floor, it, it, you know, Jesus was sleeping in the middle of this storm. So they had to go and wake him up. Now, there are, there are a few items through this. Um, you can read through this, this scripture, and there's so much to be learned here. Uh, but there's a few that I want to point out today. And, of course, I'm going to be a, a good Baptist and do my three points, and then we're going to get out of here. But I would advise you to go and just look at this. Look at this situation, because this is a great example of our life. Someone once said that you're either you're either coming out of a storm, in a storm, or you're going into a storm. 
Um, the point being that we all have storms. Listen, there are all kinds of storms, aren't there? We've all been through storms. Um, some of you, besides the storm that we're going through right now, I mean, there are cancer storms. There are loved ones just passed away storms. There are divorce storms. Um, teenage storms. My teenagers paying attention here. That's a storm, right? We all have storms. But in this passage, we find great hope. We find, really, what the Christian's response should be to a storm. So, I want us to look, starting back in verse 35, at something Jesus said. And this is my first point. I don't have a name for the point. It's just my first point. On the same day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. The first thing that we can remember about a storm is if God said something, that's what's going to happen. And it seems to me like the disciples kind of weren't paying attention. He didn't say, let us get to the middle of the sea and drown. He said, let's go to the other side. Proverbs 19.21, if you want to write it down, I'm not going to take the time to turn all these. I wrote them down because there's so many verses. But Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. That's it. You plan all you want to plan. I think it's good to plan. I think we should have a plan. But we must do it remembering that whatever God's got planned is what's going to take place. You you can go easy, or or you can take the hard route, depending on if you plan with him or you plan against him, right? I mean, Jonah's a good example of that. God said, I'm going to send Jonah to Nineveh. Jonah said, no, you ain't. And God went, right? I mean, Jonah could have went, okay, Nineveh we go. Nice little walk to Nineveh, good time with the Lord, right? But he decided, like most of us do, no, I'm going to be rebellious. And God said, well, you're going to Nineveh. How many of y'all have kids, right? How, how, has, have you ever had a kid that you've been like, clean your room? <coughs> Pardon me. Clean your room. I'm not cleaning my room. Yeah, right. I, I'll tell you what my mom used to do to me. I, would be, I was such a rebellious child. She would take my hand while I screamed, dragging me across the floor. And she would take my hand and force it to grab a toy. And then she would drag me across the room and make me drop it in the toy box. That happened about twice, and then I decided it was just a lot easier to clean my own room. Amen? When God says it's going to happen, it's going to, it's going to happen. The purpose of the Lord will stand. That can give us great confidence. It can scare us, too, depending on if you're in His will or you're out of His will. He has a plan for your life, and His plan will stand. Now, now make no mistake here. It could be that His plan is that you don't come through the storm. Now, that's what we don't like. That's the truth that we don't want to pay attention to. We love to hear we're going to get through the storm. We love to see the stories about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and that he was there with them in that fiery storm, and that he was there and they came out the other side. We don't like to hear the ones at the end of uh, the Hebrews chapter 12, where it says, and some of them were cut in half and flayed alive and crucified upside down. See, I just I get to the part where that starts, I just quit reading and go somewhere else. I don't want to hear about those of faith. They had faith to be cut in half. No, I like faith to be rescued from the jaws of lions. So that's where it gets scary. See, that's the part I don't like, is when his plan doesn't jive with what I want. Now, I want to see, because I want to be like disciples. I want to look and see what Jesus has to say, and I want to know before I get in the boat, we're going to the other side. What I don't like is when he says, let's get in the boat and no more information. How many of y'all have been in that situation? God's got you going through something. He hasn't told you how it's going to turn out. That's difficult. He has a plan, and sometimes it includes rescue. We like that. But sometimes he just promises to be with us in death or in pain or in suffering. And we don't like that as good. But never, ever, ever doubt He's in the boat with you. We need to be able to take that from this lesson. Go wake Him up. Now I know, He's already awake. You just need to realize he's go awake, or that He's awake and go talk to Him. 
And, he, and when he does, he, he, this is some things that he's going to remind you of. If you're, a, if you're a child of his and you're spending time in the Word of God, he'll be reminding you of some of these things. Proverbs 16, 9. The heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. I spent a lot of time over the last couple of days with my youngest grandchild. We call him Boogie. Now, we call him Boogie not because of Boogie. We call him Boogie because he Boogie, 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 Boogie. I mean, he's just gone. I mean, he don't even look where he's going. I've never seen a kid fall down so much. He just starts running before he even turns in the correct direction. And he just falls. And I can't tell you how many times he has planned his steps. And I've had to grab a hold of his arm and redirect him. God has a plan for your steps. Now, I want Boogie to walk. I don't want to have to carry him everywhere, so I make him walk. And sometimes, if I think it ain't going to be too bad, I even let him fall down. I mean, if he's boogieing across the grass, I know he's going to fall, I just go, well, you're going to fall down. And he does, 15 times, between here and there. Kid just can't do it yet. Isaiah 14.24 says, The Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so it shall be. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand except for COVID-19, except for cancer, except for divorce, except for loss of life. No. No. That, there's something about the Lord controlling things that can either give you peace or can make you very fearful. I'll admit, I've experienced both. But the fact of the matter is, his plans will stand. It became a great comfort when I realized that until God has finished with me, I'm invincible. That's it. Until He's done. Now, now listen, I want to be very clear, and I'm going to clarify this even more later. Um, that's not just for the Christian. I, how does it work? I, I do not know, and nobody else does either. I just know God has does His thing, and we're supposed to do our thing. Let me give you a perfect for instance. We, uh, in Bible study when I was in the military a few hundred pounds ago, we would talk about being warriors and being military personnel and you know what we would do. And we would come up with these hypothetical questions. Like in Romans 1 it says, God places all authority. Well, if that's true, then that means he put Hitler where he was. And so then the hypothetical question would be, as a soldier, if you would have been able to shoot Hitler, knowing that God put him there, would you shoot him? And the answer is, of course I would, as quickly as I could. Right? Because God has His things and we have our things. I don't know how all that works. I just know that God has a plan and He has stuff for us to do in that plan. And so as long as we're busy trying to do the stuff that we're supposed to do within that plan, we're invincible. We're not going to die until He gets ready for us to die. Proverbs 21.31 says, one of my favorite verses, The horse is prepared for battle, but the Lord determines the outcome. The, Lord, the horse is prepared for battle. He didn't say, at that point in time, just stand next to the horse, see what happens. No, no. We're supposed to prepare the horse for battle. But let's never forget, the Lord has determined the outcome. Man, that's good. The Lord has determined the outcome. I've, I've read the end of the book. Guess what? We win. We win. It's just different for Christians. It's different for us. We, we need to be facing things different. And even in the storms, there's nothing that is a better physical example of the gospel of Christ than the way we react in a storm. It freaks people out. When everything else is just going crazy, even in your life, their life, whatever life, the world's life, and we say things like, God got it. There's two reactions. There are the people who are very cynical, very prideful, and God hasn't broken their heart yet. And they go, ah, you're just saying that because you can't face the truth. But then there's the other side, the ones that we're looking for, that they, God's touched them. They realize they're, they're trapped. They have no hope. And they cling to that. They see that in us, and they go, how can I have that? How can I have that peace? Well, hopefully we're ready for them. The horse is prepared for battle, but the Lord determines the outcome. I would be amiss if I did not mention at this point in time, Luke 12, 25. And which one of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature, her stature? Some versions translate it to your, a moment to your life. The idea is, worrying ain't going to get you anywhere. 
it's not going to do anything for you. Look, y'all, you're in a boat with Jesus, and you're going wherever He says. And if you're saved, you can take comfort of that. It was in the Battle of First Manassas. Uh, that's what the folks in during the War of Northern Aggression from the North called it. It's also known as the Battle of Bull Run um, by those who us that believed in states' rights. We can have that discussion later. I'm joking, of course. I'm really glad the North won, but it was uh, General Jackson. He was a one of the greatest generals that ever lived. And there was a great conflict going on, and General Bernard B. yelled to his men, Look there! There stands Jackson like a stone wall. And he got the nickname Stonewall Jackson. Because he's just on his horse, bullets flying, stuff going crazy. And then Bernard yelled to his men, Rally behind the Virginian! There stands Jackson like a stone wall. Well, if you read your history, you find out General Jackson was a great man of God. And his favorite thing to tell his men was, God has a plan for my death. And whether it be on the back of a horse or in the middle of my bed at night, I shall be prepared to face death in a glorious way. Stonewall Jackson. And that's good stuff. I'm not sure I agree completely with Jackson on certain things, you know. Uh, there's something to be said for getting off the horse and hiding behind a rock when bullets are flying, okay? But the uh, the process in his brain, I think, was uh, his faith was probably a lot stronger than mine. <clears throat> you got to decide, each one of you, how the Lord has told you to prepare your horse. The horse is prepared for battle, but the Lord determines the outcome. He has a plan for you, and He has plans for you. In other words, He's already decided the outcome. And now... You get to participate. Well, tell me how that works, Pastor Hoover. Ain't going to happen. Don't know. Can't. There are just some things that belong to God. I do not know and cannot tell you how God's absolute sovereignty and man's free will works. I have ideas. I have thoughts. But anybody that tells you that they know exactly how that works out, be careful listening to what they've got to say. We need a little humility. We need people to be able to say, I just don't know how that works. I just know that's what God's doing. It's a great mystery, but true nonetheless. Okay, so you're in the boat, and he's with you, and there's a storm, and he said we're going to the other side. Now, so if, so if you know that, if he's revealed to you, these are the plans that I have for you in your life. We're going to the other side. You have to remember, what has Jesus told you? You must get with the Lord. Ask him what his plans for you. Sometimes he lets you know. We, we knew we were supposed to go to Costa Rica when we went. Had no, had no clue how we were going to get there or stay there. But we had faith because God had made it very clear we were supposed to go. And he took care of the storms in the boat. Verse 36. Let's move on. You guys are going to have to listen a lot quicker. I'm never going to get through this. Verse 36. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was and other little boats with him. As we travel in life, it helps us to realize we ain't alone. We're not alone. There's lots of other little boats around us. And we've got Jesus in our boat. And a lot of times those other little boats are looking to us to see how we react. Why? Because we've got the instructor in our boat. It's important how we react because there are other little boats with us. We're in the storm, and so many times we're in this storm, we forget. There may be a very good reason that you're going through that storm. I, I could probably go through many people out here who have been through storms in their life. You've made it through to the other side, and then you found somebody that's going through a similar storm, and they come to you, and you're able to tell them, God has got this. This is what He did for me. There are other little boats all around us in these storms. This is a great opportunity for us to win people to Christ. We have to remember that the reason that we're here the reason that we've been rescued is to be ambassadors for Christ. And we just have to... Well, I'll tell you what, Satan just loves to get us off that focus. Doesn't he? I mean, he'll do anything he can to keep us from being an ambassador from that legal system to this legal system. He doesn't want us coming from there and telling everybody here they've been freed. He likes his slaves right where they're at. So we've got to remember these other little boats. Satan, that old fox, the accuser, is great power, and he brings great 
trials. But there's another truth that we often don't like. I'm going to admit it. I don't like it. I don't get it. I've taught myself to like it because it's God. Because here's the truth. He can't do anything to you unless God gives him permission. That is difficult. I mean, man, we spend a lot of time asking why, don't we? Why me? I have an answer. You ready? We don't know. (laughs) I don't know why you. I don't know why me sometimes. I don't know why this. I don't know why we're going through what we're going through right now. I don't know so many things. You know, it doesn't hurt us to just go, I don't know. This is the comfort we have from stories like this. I don't have to know. I know he's got. He's in my boat. Hey, Jesus, I think we're going to sink. Now, I think oftentimes with me, he's still taking a nap, and he's like, we're fine. Shut up. We're good. Because I complain a lot. He gets tired of me complaining. Amen? Probably not. I don't know. It's my imagination. I asked a question the other day. This is my, I do this all the time. My, my wife will be doing this pretty soon, letting me know I'm tra- chasing rabbit trails. Have you ever wondered what God does? I mean, I asked this on Facebook, and I got the, the answers. You know, He loves us. He watches over us. He cares. He, he's being worshipped. I know. But do you think He ever goes fishing? I mean, when He started off, right, He's going for walks with people in the garden. You know? I mean, He wasn't just sitting on a throne. You know, just, I mean... I don't know what he does, but I ask him sometimes. Hey, Lord, how was your day? Did you go fishing today? I wonder if he goes fishing. You know, I don't know. I have no idea what that has to do with anything I'm talking about. I just think it's cool. I know there are a lot of things we don't know. But I do know that he has the controls, and he has got it, and he doesn't lie. Isaiah 45, 7 says... I, now this is, freaks me out. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all of these things. <laughs> Why? I don't know, but he said it. Can I focus a bit on the storm we share right now? Our boat, all the other little boats, same storm. He orchestrated it all. Boy, we don't like that, do we? We want to blame everything on Satan. Now, Satan may have been the instrument. I don't know. But I know it did. he wasn't sitting up there and went, Oh, look what happened. Virus. Now what are we going to do? Better come up with a plan. That's not how it works. That's not how he works. It's his domain. COVID-19 is his domain. It's His plan. Every life, every death, nothing happens without His say-so. He is not surprised. He did not get caught off guard. Proverbs 16.4 says, The Lord has made everything for its purpose, even the wicked for the day of trouble. You want me to give you the secret answer to why that's true? Say it with me. I don't know. We don't know. TV evangelists don't know. I'll even go as far as to say Adrian Rogers didn't know. I know. Walking on holy ground there. We don't know. Even great men of God. In fact, I I feel they're great men of God because they're not afraid to say, I don't know. But God is very clear that He has authority over all of it. Our boat, your boat, the little boats, the big boat. He's got control. So, Here they are in a storm, and they wake up Jesus and they say, don't you care that we're going to die? You ever ask that question? Don't you care? Now, Jesus had options at this point, didn't he? He's God. He could have said, well, maybe you'll live. Let's see what happens. Right? I mean, he could have have just, this could have been a different teaching technique, and he could have said, hey, man, it's pretty bad. Let's see how this turns out. He could have just walked away. Literally, you know. He walks on water. He could have just jumped out the boat. Gone. It's an option. He could have called a legion of angels to come, lift the boats up, move them to the shore. But he just speaks. Peace. Be still. 
Psalm 135, 6 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does, in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. He is... It, no, this is me talking. The verse has now ended. He is in control. He has a plan. And, and listen, if He says, here's where we're going, that's where you're going. See, they're in the same boat, pardon the pun, <laughs> as we are. They're in a storm. They, they had little faith. Little understanding. Remember what is faith? Go look this up. In uh, Hebrews 11.1, 1, right? The substance of things not seen, the evidence or evidence of things not seen, substance of things hoped for. Uh, they forgot that he had told them they're going to the other side. They forgot about the little boats around them. Oftentimes, in our storms, we just really need to be reminded he's in control and, and there are certain things he's set in motion. They were very afraid of this storm and they were afraid of drowning. Then Jesus stands up and speaks, and there's a great calm. In our storms, sometimes He just stands up and speaks, and our hearts get calm. Sometimes He just has to calm our heart. If you go and read Fox's Book of Martyrs, you will understand story after story. Or go read, read some of uh, Corey Ten Boom's stuff when they went through the Holocaust and they were in the concentration camps. Different Christians that at different times were going through horrible things. And God gave them the grace at that moment that it just it didn't affect them at all. People burned at the stake, didn't feel the fire. We had a gal come and talk to uh, Piney Point. Um, I can't remember her name. A little Chinese gal. And she had been thrown into prison in China and been there for years in a little bitty cell, no blanket. And, she, and it got really cold where she was at. I mean, people lost toes and fingers. She never even felt the cold, she told us. I was very humbled by her as she stood and said, I feel so bad for you Americans as I stood in New York and I looked at all the lights and all the shops and I thought, you have so much to distract you from the Lord. This gal has been through the storms. And sometimes Jesus takes you through the storms, but sometimes He just gives you grace to go through the storms. In fact, Corey Tenboom was interviewed. If you don't know who she is, you'll just have to find out. Um, and they said, how did you get through it? And she said, "God, the grace of God. And the interviewer said, do you have that grace now? And she said, oh, no. <laughs> I couldn't go through that right now unless I was in it, and God gave me more grace. He gives us what we need when we need it, but remember, he's in the boat. He doesn't sleep anymore, so we don't have to wake him up anymore. But we need to remember he's in the boat and go talk to him. We're talking to a lot of different people, aren't we? But are we spending any time talking to him? <clears throat> so look at verse 41, and I'll come to a conclusion here. Verse 41, I love this. This is my third point, even though I really didn't do a good job of point one, point two, point three. but this is it. Verse 41 says, And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be? Even the wind and sea obey him. They were scared before. But when he stood up and said, Peace be still in the middle of this, and they found out he had control over it all, then they were scared. Why? I think with my sanctified imagination, that they hadn't come to the realization, obviously, that he was God yet. It, it, they said so. Who is this? Who can this be? Now listen, these were Jewish people. They'd been raised in synagogue. They knew God had control over everything. There was no doubt. So when they look at Jesus and say, who, who has the power to do this? They know the answer. They just hadn't made the connection yet. Sometimes we need to remake that connection, don't we? What's going on? How's this going to happen? What's going to take place? What? Oh, that's right. Who can this be, this one in the boat with us? God. I forgot he's in my boat. Not only is he in my boat, he lives inside me. There is a fear. This shows us there is fear. But really not for the born again, not for the twice born. Do you know that we're told over 365 times in the Word of God, don't be afraid, do not fear? 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's for the storms, too. If you're living in fear of anything, you've got to take it to Jesus. He said so. He said so in 1 Peter 5.7, Cast all your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. Isn't that good? Man, I really have to remind myself of that sometimes. He cares for me. It's easy for me to believe He cares for a group. It's easy for me to believe He cares maybe for a nation or a church. I have to remind myself constantly, He cares for me. 
oftentimes I told my boys through the course of their life, they'd say, don't you care? I'd say, yeah, I care. It's just not going to change my decision. So, so we have to be clear. He cares. He may not be changing his decision, but he does care. He empathizes. He came to earth and lived as one of us so that he could empathize with everything that we go through. It's so good. And he tells us in, in 1 John 4, perfect love casts out fear. And we win no matter what. Can there, can there be, really, can there be a greater verse at these times than the verse that says, and we know all things work together for good for those who love God and are the called according to His purpose? What is that, Romans 8, 28? Right? Let me read that again. Listen, listen to this. That's what he said. We know. Do you know? All things work together for good to those who love God. Do you love God? To those who are the called according to His purpose. See, there's a key in there. To those who love God. The called according to His purpose. That's us. That's the Christian. But there's great reason to fear for the unsaved. Matthew 10.28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear Him which is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Some of y'all here or, or, or listening out there, I don't know, maybe you've never been born again. He's going to recast those that reject His Son into hell. That's not my words. That's His words. Why live like that? Why live in this fear? Why keep that fear? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it feel great to never fear a storm? Or at the very least, the minute a storm's, the storm hits and, and you start to fear, you remember to turn in your boat and there's somebody in the boat with you that's in complete control that at any moment can stand up and go, peace, be still, if he wants to. And he cares for you. To have the confidence that he has a plan for you that nothing can stop. Whatever storm you may be going through can't affect the plan that he has for you. That gives me comfort. It's easy. It's easy. If you're a person that has not done that, you're not, you've not been born twice. You've been born once, physically born, but you've never been born again. This is how it happens. And I'm just quoting the Bible, Romans 10.9. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Anybody can argue with that all they want to. I'm going to go with what God said. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Not there's a good chance. Maybe down the road, I hope that happens. You will be. His promise. And then, you're in the boat with Jesus. <laughs> and anything that happens, well, we don't have to wake Him up anymore, do we? But we do have to turn to Him and remember He's the one that's in control. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Maybe that's you today. Maybe you just forgot the boat that you're in. Maybe you're scared. Man, ain't nothing wrong with being scared. You know, the difference between a hero and a coward is not whether or not you're afraid. It's what you do with the fear. We're programmed to fear. What we have to teach ourselves is where to run with our fear. And we need to run to the Lord. And so maybe that's you today. You're here, whatever storm you may going through, be going through, you're afraid. Hey, you know what? Really, really, really take it to Jesus. He cares for you. He's in your boat. But maybe you're out there. Maybe you're here. Maybe you're here in this congregation today. I don't know anybody's heart. I don't know anybody out there, their heart that's watching on Facebook. But maybe you've never been born again, and you are scared. And maybe you don't understand much of what I said. The Bible says that without the Spirit of God illuminating these two things to you, you cannot understand the things of God. But He comes, and He illuminates things, and He quickens your spirit and makes you alive. And now is the day of your salvation, the Bible says. And it says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God has raised Him from the dead, you'll be saved. You can do that right where you're sitting. You can do that back there in Facebook. We encourage people, as I will encourage anybody that's here, to bring that to the altar. 
Come down here and kneel. Um, you know, with the social distancing that we've got, uh, you can stand a little bit away from me or Pastor Justin, and we'll talk about this. You can catch us afterwards. I'm not sure how we're handling the altar call with social distancing, but we want you to be comfortable. But more than anything, I want to make sure that I'm going to see you for forever. And this is the way it happens. Let me say it one more time so that you understand it's not me. It's the Word of God. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. I invite you to come and do that right now. I invite you to come to the altar if you'd like. And like I say, let's let's be kind and practice that distance thing. But you can come to the altar or for the front pew and pray and just bring things to the Lord. Lord, I'm scared. I'm scared of what's going on with COVID-19. I'm, I'm going through a divorce. I've got cancer. I, I've got a loved one that's in bad shape. And you just want to come and pray, now's the time. I'd invite you to come, get on your knees before God and bring it to Him. You there at home, watching on Facebook Live, hey, get down on the floor. Just get before God humbly and say, that's me, Lord. I've, I've never been born again. I do confess that Jesus is Lord. I do believe in my heart God has raised Him from the dead. And it's His promise that in that moment you're saved. Call somebody. Tell somebody. Write to us and let us know that that happened. We'd be happy to contact you by email or by phone. If you're here now, I'd invite you to do that. But whatever, wherever you do this, please do it. Please take your fears to the Lord that's in the boat with you the one that's in control of everything, and just turn it over to Him and say, Lord, I know you got it. Just let me know what my part is.